this is Ann Jones Guider uh, coming from District 4 in the western side of uh, Douglas County. Uh, the people over here kind of refer it to God's country because uh, it's a lot of open areas. Uh, uh, most of the homes in the southern portion of it have to have acreage because of the Dog River Basin. But I have a great program for you today. And as a lead in, we're going to have a short clip, and then I will come back and introduce you to my guest. When you're thinking about an idea or have something that you might want to do to think about the worst case uh, and what the worst thing is that could happen, but you usually don't think about what the best case is, and oftentimes you can't even imagine what the best case would be, because when we started, there's no way I would have imagined that we would have bought a farm, that we would have had all this excitement around something. It's such a simple idea. One of the hardest parts for me when I was working in corporate America was just not feeling connected to my work. They went from kind of sipping rum on the beach, talking about it, to four years later, um, decided to go and buy this popsicle machine and start freezing them and seeing what people thought. Literally 20 hour days during the peak of the season. But after a few months of success, it was either like, you're already working here a lot, you wanna quit that secure uh, job. I was a prosecutor at the time, so I was putting people in jail every day. So I went from putting people in jail to putting smiles on faces. And it's just like such a change of, of attitude, of, of sense of purpose. And on any given Saturday, you could find 100 people standing around eating popsicles. And to bring the community together, see people re-engage was a really special thing for us. And that's what really made us think about what else can we do? We started looking for a farm and kind of went for it. I mean, we knew from the beginning that it wasn't going to be a money maker in the same way that a, that a pop company can be. We spent all this time planting stuff just for nothing to happen with it, or the deer to come in and eat all the strawberry plants before any strawberries came. So it's been a lot of tough times, but this year we've been able to see kind of what's going to really happen out here, and uh, it's exciting. People loved it. People love the idea of a, a farm to pop like concept. We can say, we put that on your table. We know where it's been from the time that it came out of the ground until the time you're eating it. It was more just this idea of something that felt really good, something that would be fun to share both with the employees, the community, and, and Nick and I to come out and have a, a fun project to be working on. Living the life that I want to live is all about taking a risk and doing something that I really believe in, truly want to do. So our original idea, which is just, let's do something different, I'd say it's kind of worked. Okay, we're back, and uh, I have with me Nick Kars, which, which is one of the co-owners of King of Pops. I'm sure most of you have heard of King of Pops, but you're going to find out a lot more about it today. And we also have Stephen Dobeck, uh, who is the manager of the farm that is located right here in District 4. So... Um, Nick, I'm going to start with you. You're the co-founder. Can you tell us a little bit about how King of Pops came about? Sure. Thank you, Commissioner, and uh, really glad to be here today to talk with you and uh, the folks in Douglas County and um, tell them a little bit more about who we are and you know how we ended up on a, on a farm in Douglas County. So uh, my brother Stephen and I started King of Pops. 10 years ago, amazingly, so in 2010. And, you know, with everything going on today, it's hard to believe that it's been that long and 
um, still trying to figure out what the next step is. But at any rate, uh, we started off selling uh, popsicles out of a little push cart at a gas station on uh, on a corner of um, some busy streets in Atlanta. And from there, it's grown into, you know, a kind of real business where we're selling pops all over the South and cities, not only Atlanta and around Atlanta, but also uh, Charleston, Charlotte, Richmond, Nashville, and really all over the place. So that's been a lot of fun to, to grow and, and experience. Part of that was um, one of our sales channels was always at farmer's markets. And at farmer's markets, you really get to know farmers and, and folks in the community. And we really fell in love with the idea of using fresh ingredients and uh, local ingredients. And so we would always buy from other farmers in the community and in Georgia and in the South. And after a couple of years, we decided that, hey, it would be a really cool idea to go from farm to pop instead of farm to table or, or farm to whatever else, but farm to pop. And so we started looking around. We fell in love with a piece of property um, right there in your district, uh, you know, 166 and Post Road. We named it King of Crops and um, we started growing fruit for popsicles. The, the farm has been through a lot over the past few years and over the guidance of Stephen in particular, it's really come into its own. And um, I'll let him talk a little bit more about the farm in particular, but we're just really happy and um, grateful to be able to grow fruit for our pops out there and uh, be a part of the community. Now, Nick, um, I know that when you were a little boy, you did not dream of growing up and being a popsicle maker. So uh, tell us a little bit about your background and your brother's background, too, and uh, how you got this idea of making popsicles. Sure, of course. Yeah. So I don't actually remember what I wanted to be when I grew up back when I was five, but you're right. It wasn't a popsicle salesman. So uh, I don't know how, how it actually happened that I got here, but um, went to school at University of Georgia for computer type stuff, graduated, started at AIG, which is the big insurance company that famously failed in the financial crisis. Um, got bored there a little bit, went back to law school at Georgia State and became a criminal prosecutor in Gwinnett County, actually. Um, after a few years of that, I found that that was also not my passion. But uh, in, that, in the meantime, I'd gotten my younger brother, Stephen, who's also the co-founder of a job at AIG. So like I mentioned, that, that company famously failed in 2008 or 9. He got laid off and was sleeping on my couch and looking for something else to do. So he was interviewing for jobs and um, with a little bit of prodding from myself and my older brother, who's an anthropologist, um, you know, we, we had kind of fallen in love with this idea of, of the Mexican paleta. We had visited Mexico a few years earlier and thought it was the coolest thing to just have these, these popsicles available everywhere uh, for sale out of carts. And so, uh, I don't know. I think he had about five or six thousand dollars in his account, and that was what we started the business on. So it was just him to start with, and maybe two or three months in, um, he invited me to come on board because I was helping on nights and weekends anyway while I was doing prosecution during the day. And uh, yeah, I quit my job and and joined up, and we started doing that full time in in 2010. So. Yeah, we came from, he was a sports journalist, and my older brother, like I said, is an anthropologist, and I have a, a legal background, so certainly not culinary or agricultural <laughs> or, or anything else, but, but it's been a lot of fun to figure out. Well, you're, you're quite young to be in such a large business now, and uh, you can tell by the look on your face that you enjoy what you're doing. And, and I think that's the, the secret to life, to enjoy uh, the path that you choose as you go through your life. And um, it, it started out small, and I, I've been to Mexico many times, and I've seen the little carts, even on the beaches, oh, yeah. and um, of the uh, selling the ice cream. And so you took something so simple and just made it into a, a big enterprise. So, uh, um being that you're in business with your brothers, how does that work? 
Uh, how does it, you know, brothers tend to <laughs> have a few yeah. conflicts. I have two boys of my own. So how does that work for you, having a family yeah. business? Well, I think it's been interesting. I would say that I would have it no other way because I can't imagine not having a partner in business to lean on and toss ideas off of and argue about and brainstorm and, and all of those kinds of things. But I think it also comes with the, um, you know, inherent bickering that probably does happen between, uh, between <laughs> brothers and between family. So we, we've certainly gotten past that, and I think we respect each other enough and realize that we both have different abilities and um, things that we add to the business. We're, we're different people and with different skills, so I think that's good. And I think what's more is that um, my parents, up until this past year when things have gone a little bit south for, for sales, have also worked with us. So my dad was in the food business working for Hormel for 34 years, I think, in, in his career. And then my mom um, still actually helps us collect our uh, um, unpaid invoices. So helps with collections and, and calling on people to say, hey, you better pay my boys. Otherwise, we're going to come and get you. So, uh, yeah, my parents are also involved. So it's been a lot of fun. And uh, I don't know. I, I don't think I can say anything bad about having a family business at this point. It hasn't, hasn't created any bad blood between us. So that's been really, really nice. Well, I was the tax commissioner out here in Douglas County for 28 years, so I know about collections. So okay. when I retire as a, a county commissioner, I make a uh, knock at your door and say, you need any help with QuickBooks or something? <laughs> no, I'm good. Well, uh, I don't want Stephen to sit out there in the sun and just burn up. He's drinking that that water like a, a gallon of uh, uh, whatever, but uh, I know it's hot out there too, Stephen. So I want to bring you in before you melt away. Uh, you know, first of all, let me apologize that we're having to do this uh, through the computer. I was really looking forward to going down there, walking the farm with you and having films done down there but because of the pandemic it has thrown a wrench in the process but uh, we're, we're going to do the best of what we have and we are going to have uh, some of the film clips taken down there at the farm um, and insert it into this uh, program so but uh, Stephen uh, so what is your role in the king of crops um, I, I guess I'm doing just about everything that needs to be done out here, which, uh, would include anything from maintenance work to, um, running our, the UPIC operation that we've been doing on our blueberries and blackberries out here for the last month plus. Um, I fix equipment. I take care of the chickens. Uh, I mean, you name it. If it needs to be done on the farm, um, that's pretty much what I'm here for. Um, how many so, how many employees do you have down there right now just how me many? usually just, uh, usually um, I would, no. it, yeah and I do have uh, there's usually another full-time person with me but right now it's it's been me um, since lockdown started so um, that's certainly been challenging but uh, we've really done well with uh, the amount of fruit we've had for people to come out and pick um it's been a pretty big payoff the last six weeks so kind of made it all worth it and reminded me why i do this in the first place so yeah i told you i shared with you before we started filming that i used to ride horses down there when mm -hmm. gene daniel owned the farm and he had an azalea farm and yep. of course all, all, of, all of us went down there and bought azaleas from him too but he was just a dear friend of mine. So I know where you are and everything. I know you've done a lot of transformations of the property. If you want to go into any details there. Uh, yeah, I would say uh, the, the nursery that uh, Daniel nursery, they, they kind of, um, I would say maybe drew the lines for the farm and then they, they kind of colored them in the way they wanted to. And, um, I've just kind of been recoloring in those lines ever since I got here, kind of. So we've um, taken areas around the farm that used to be used uh, for, like, greenhouses or things like that. Uh, we've gotten rid of a lot of unused structures and uh, sort of other related stuff. Um, 
and basically created open fields for us to grow uh, a bunch of different stuff. And so I planted uh, Asian pears, Bartlett pears. Uh, we've got plum trees. We have pawpaw trees. We have muscadines. We have blueberries. We have blackberries. We have goji berries. We have figs. Uh, I planted a small little bunch of cherry trees. <coughs> we also have probably about an acre's worth of um, raised bed space that in any given year we can do uh, ginger, basil, hot peppers, all that sort of thing, annual stuff for, for pop production. So uh, there's kind of a lot going on. Um, and a lot of what I did when I started in March of 18, a lot of the first year plus of, of the work we did out here after I got here was just kind of uh, reclaiming like most of the post road frontage of the property, um, kind of de brushifying that and making it more friendly towards growing crops. Um, and just in general, trying to spruce the property up uh, and get it back to, you know, the way it should be looking out here. So um, it's been a lot of work, but uh, two plus years on now, it's, it's been awesome. And like I said, this, this summer has been a, a pretty big payoff. So it's been great. Very good. That's a great lead in, Nick, for uh, how do you come up with the flavors that you come up with? <laughs> You've got some strange ones. We'll just say um, creative and interesting, not strange, but, <laughs> but I appreciate it. And I wanted to say um, Stephen is so humble in his um, characterization of the work that he's done out there because it has just been a one-man show for the past uh, most of this year. And then before that, we had a, a farmhand as well that was working by his side, but they together have transformed that property into a truly uh, beautiful orchard. And it's a young orchard now and is starting to pay off with the berries. But um, we can only imagine how beautiful it's going to be in another another few years when some of those pear and plum and pawpaw and uh, fig trees that he mentioned are, are going to be mature and, um, you know, able to be enjoyed by everybody. So just wanted to throw that in there. But our flavors are uh, really... He's turning red from being so humble. So. <laughs> this doesn't bother me. I can sit in the sun all day. It's when I start moving around that it gets hot. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but yeah, our flavors have been inspired by travels, um, both in the United States and, and throughout the world. So we kind of fall in love with uh, restaurants or desserts or cocktails that we have and try and transform what we've seen into pop flavors. And so whether that's, you know, Southern banana pudding or whether that's uh, Thai iced tea or, or Turkish coffee or um, some summertime favorites like a strawberry lemonade. I think all of those things are uh, appropriate and able to be put into popsicle uh, format. And so we think that it's kind of our place to do flavors that you wouldn't find uh, with every other brand in the grocery store. So we haven't done a vanilla or a cherry or a grape. Um, just because you can find those, and I think other people do them well, and um, we're trying to do something a little bit, a little bit more different that that sets our brand apart and makes us uh, special and something to seek out. So, I think we're always continuing to innovate and evolve and try new things. And whether it's uh, just in pops, or this year we rolled out soft serve with some, you know, all fruit uh, toppings and and varieties. That's been a lot of fun, or whether it's King of Pups, which are our frozen dog treats. Um, it's all yeah. about innovation for us and continuing to uh, go down that road. Let's talk about King of Pups. Uh, you're actually saying you make popsicles for dogs. Is That's that right. right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah. The frozen dog treats, and um, they're you know made of yogurt, banana, peanut butter, and honey. So. I won't say all dogs love them, but 98% of dogs love them. <laughs> I, get, I always feel really bad if a dog kind of walks away from it and turns <laughs> to it. But I guess they're, they're picky eaters amongst us, just like uh, dogs. So it's kind of the way it works. Um, but yeah, it, it's really nice. And I think uh, business-wise, it's a big industry. If you think about the pet industry, I mean, I don't know how many billions of dollars it is, but people spend a lot of money taking care of their pets. And uh, they want to treat their pets and their kids and themselves, you know, and we're, we're giving them the opportunity to do that. 
Well, I have a dog. I have Max, who is an Australian Shepherd, and he has volunteered to come down there and be a taster for you. Oh, wow. He just, just told me that. <laughs> and he would let you know which ones are the better ones. Okay. okay. So he, he, he just told me that he uh, volunteers to do that. He's available? Okay. Yes, he's available. That's right. <laughs> what are some of his, uh, does he eat any fruit or what are some of his favorite things to eat or does he only eat dog food? Uh, anything that mama is eating. He yeah. Eat. Okay. <laughs> he is my shadow. You know, that breed actually takes to one person and will be their shadow. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're very uh, personable like that. But uh, one one flavor that Stephen mentioned, or berry that he mentioned, was the blackberry. Do you presently have a blackberry popsicle? Oh, yeah. We've got a few. So um, probably our most uh, regular in the crowd is a blackberry ginger lemonade. So oh it's got a little bit of spice to it, but it's also, you know, really refreshing on a hot summer day. And we've also done just... Um, you know, like a blackberry lime. We've done a, a blackberry um, cobbler, so kind of for the fall, where it's a creamy with some some cookies, some crust in it, and uh, probably some other blackberry ones as well. Blackberry banana, I think we've done in the past, kind of tastes like a smoothie. Um, but yeah, lots of different blackberry flavors. So how many uh, facilities do you actually make the popsicles in? Uh, are they scattered all around just one? Just and that's one. in Atlanta, in yep. Inman Park or whatever. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, we're in um, just one. We did used to make them in each of the different cities throughout the South. And um, as we grew, it became more of a, um, I, I don't want to say hazard, but food safety became a higher concern for us. And being able to make everything in a you know certified production facility in one place just made sense cost-wise so we could have a um, you know, qualified and certified quality assurance person on site and food safety, you know, became a lot more important. And you mentioned that you are in restaurants. So uh, anybody going out to some of the fine restaurants around Atlanta or, or around the nation, I guess, yeah. uh, can uh, look for King of Pops there too. That's right. Yeah, we're, so, in, we're in some grocery stores and we're in some restaurants. We we're, we sell at universities, we sell at gift shops, we sell at museums and water parks and beaches. So really anywhere that uh, you know people might want to snack. Um, out in Douglas County, we're at the farmer's table, so you can always find pops there. And then there's there's a couple other coffee shops and a couple of places in Carrollton as well. So it's there's uh, a freezer at at Stoddard's too, I think, that the government, okay. which I love. That's, there's a what? There's a there's a pop freezer at Stoddard's as well out on two seven. Oh, yeah, at Stoddard's, the gun place. Okay. Yeah. yeah. The firing range. I've been there too. <laughs> kind of cracked me up when I saw that in there. That 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 cracked me up. I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> that is that is really neat. Um, now uh, you also do uh, agritourism. Would you like to elaborate on that? Yeah, I'll let Stephen take that one. But um, like you pointed out, the the UPIC operation, um, it's a UPIC experience, actually, we call it, where you not only get to see the farm and chat with Stephen, but also go home with some berries and a pop. So, uh, Stephen, if you want to talk a little bit more about that and then some of the other stuff. Uh, yeah, I would say uh, before this year, the most of, of what we did was uh, like school tours, 4-H groups, things like that. Um, which right now seems like a little difficult to do, but uh, once school becomes kind of a thing again, I'm sure we'll be back on that. But um, it also this year created an opportunity for us to host uh, like small groups of families at once um, to come out and basically do the hardest part of the job for me, which is to pick the fruit. Um, and like Nick said, they come out, I show them what we've been working on. Uh, they get you know, a couple hours out here to pick as much fruit as they want, taste test as much as they want. They get a popsicle. Um, it's, it's, it's been a big payoff for sure. And, um, everybody's loved it. Uh, so that's kind of become, a I don't know, it's been eye opening for sure. Um, and something I think that we're, we're definitely going to try to do more of. Um, and it's definitely something that, uh, any kind of successful smaller farm now, I think you've got to kind of have that aspect of it. So, um, 
I fortunately had all this fruit to share this year, and uh, it's, you know, popsicles make my job very easy. People come out here because of that, and, uh, you know, the fruit is kind of just a bonus at that point. So um, it's been, yeah, the summer's been an eye-opener, and um, we've still got a few weeks of berries left, which is awesome and also exhausting, but it's, uh, it's yeah, been mostly good. Yep. When you say berries, are you talking about strawberries or blackberries? Uh, yeah, sorry, uh, blueberries too. So we, we're pretty much, oh, there's, yes. there's maybe a little bit of blueberries left out there, but we started, that was the, the first couple of weeks we hosted folks. Um, that was all they were picking because that was what was ripe. So we have about um, maybe two or so acres of mature blueberries and about an acre or so of mature blackberries. Um and the blackberries are definitely the heavier bear of fruit right now, but the blueberries are kind of just coming into their prime right now. So there was a lot more fruit this year than there was last year, and I would expect there to be another kind of exponential explosion next year. So more fruit means more people to host, more fun, more popsicles, better for the farm. Now you have something planned for September the 12th, is that right? Uh, a picking, a berry picking time, or uh, I thought I read that, or somebody told me that. <laughs> we, we're booked through right as of right now. We're booked through for blackberries through the end of July and the first week of August. That'll be as far as we're able to make it. Beyond that, into September, we've got muscadines that are bearing fruit for the first time. So I don't know. Maybe that seems that something that people wanted to come get grapes. We'll certainly have them for the first time this year too. So. Well, you know, you can make muscadine wine. I've yeah. had some. <laughs> I bought myself a little kit. I bought myself a kit this year because I've never tried it. So I'm going to, I've got all this fruit. I can experiment with country wine. I need to to try to do that. There's a, uh, there's a winery not far from you. It's called. Down 166. Uh, little, <clears throat> yeah, a little yeah. vine road, I think. We've yep. been down there. You have to bring your, take your own food, but you yep. uh, usually have some little entertainment and everything. But it's very nice down there. But they they have a little winery down there. Yep. Um, Can I elaborate on the uh, vision too of kind of the agritourism part of that? Yes. A little bit? So yes. as the, as the orchards develop too, I think we want to spread that throughout the other other um, you know varieties, I guess. So you know, pear season or cherry season or, or fig season are all a little bit different from each other. And so as the seasons change and as the weeks pass, hopefully there will be different opportunities so people can come out and, and see how different plants and how different orchards develop. So I think we not only want it to just simply be a U-Pick operation where they come and, and get some fruit and go home, but also learn what local agriculture means, how composting works and how kind of the entire, um, you know, small farm, you know, looks and, and feels like. So they can appreciate the, the food that they're eating and hopefully seek out other local options, um, you know, when they're, when they're buying, making their buying decisions. Now, Nick, are y'all on the uh, tourism list for Douglas County? Excuse me? Are you on the tourism list? Oh. For Douglas County. Uh, not, not not will will be. Be. So we need to be. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, not sure. you will be. Yeah. <laughs> I will get in touch with Colin Cash and, and have her get in touch with y'all so that you can get on the list because uh, yeah. it's okay. not, certain, certainly it's something Douglas County is proud to have you here and it will uh, just a uh, just enhance the tourism of Douglas County too. Now, do you have any expansions or uh, changes you're making for the future? Um, are you looking to uh, locate in er other areas or having more farms or whatever? Oh man, I, I hope so. I think <laughs> it, it's been a lot of fun to to figure out, but it's uh, farming and agriculture are such a long term process um, just to see so so we bought the property in 2014 and here we are uh, five or six years later and you know we're finally to a point where we're getting fruit uh, from the land and you know that's it's it's been really great to see that transformation but it's been 
uh, a long time coming as well. So hopefully we can keep improving this property and making it more bountiful and inviting more people out. And then we'll see what the future holds for other locations. But yeah, on this location, we want to host more events, um, whatever those might be, whether they're you know, eventually weddings or, or corporate retreats or, or birthday parties or, or whatever, something like that, we think would be a lot of fun. And, you know, just create a space that the community is both comfortable coming to and, and proud of and wants to show off when, they're, when their friends and family come to town. So hopefully we create that space and, you know, um, can continue to grow it and develop it over, over the coming years. Uh, now, I'll add I know. I'm sorry. Sorry, Commissioner. I'll, I just, uh, the other thing too on the agritourism front, I guess we didn't mention is that we rent a tiny house here on Airbnb on the farm that um, has also kind of allowed more and more people to come out and see the farm. Um, and even with things being what they have been for the last few months, uh, we've been able to have people come out and stay. Um, and it's a way for people unplug, see a farm, see some animals, hear some frogs at night. So um, that's, that's been a, an awesome addition to the farm too. So, you know, during the Olympics, I rented out my basement and uh, uh, some people from up north came and rented it. And, uh, you know, we have a lot of tree frogs. <laughs> and when they would come in from their day's uh, trip to Atlanta and everything, they did not know what in the world that sound was. It was just mm -hmm. deafening, you know. And I, when I told them they were tree frogs, they said, we were scared to get out of the car. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, so uh, tell me a little about tree elves. Tree elves. Oh, man. We, yeah, we've got yeah. a going on. Yeah. So Tree Elves was um, started out with a vision to keep all of our seasonal employees, give them jobs year round. And so, as you can probably imagine, popsicles sell really well when it's 90 degrees out, but not quite as well when it's 30 degrees out. And so the winter time is a little bit more difficult for pops. And uh, we were thinking about what uh, the opposite season business might be. So Christmas trees came to mind. And we had the staff, we had the, the trucks and the infrastructure to be able to, to pull that off. And so basically what we do is we deliver uh, Christmas trees to people's houses. We dress up as elves and carry them inside and, and set up the trees for them, um, bring some holiday cheer and tell a joke or sing a song. And it's been a really cool thing to see because it's become uh, every family and every every group has their Christmas tradition, and it's become a lot of people's Christmas tradition to see the elves. And so we have kids that look forward to seeing the elves so they can give uh, their Christmas lists or give snacks to Santa or something like that. So we pick up snacks and bring them back to Santa for kids and all kinds of different stuff. So it's been really cool. And uh, business-wise, it makes sense because it's the exact opposite season of our main business. So we do have some revenue coming in and we have a way to uh, keep employees on the payroll for for a few more months during the winter now you don't grow the trees there but you you buy the ch trees elsewhere right. around douglas county area <laughs> there are some tree farms out here we did try and, so yeah we tried with um georgia trees for the first couple of years and then based on customer response we found that a lot of people wanted Fraser furs, and so we sourced those from from North Carolina. Oh, okay, all yeah. right. But we should look back into Douglas County tree farms. I agree. Yes. Um, well, y'all just look like you're having too much fun. Uh, <laughs> this to be work, you know. Uh, it's it's great to see somebody that uh, just is really into their livelihood and and enjoying the whole thing as they go about and. Plus, you're, uh, you seem to like people and you like bringing joy to people, through it, whether through your popsicles or interaction down there at the farm. But uh, what you got, 68 acres or something like that? You got it. Exactly. Yeah. And you actually, yeah. you, you nailed our company purpose, too. So our company purpose is to create unexpected moments of happiness. And so yeah. a lot of people would uh, not consider a popsicle company to be a, 
a farm operation or a Christmas tree operation or a dog treat operation. But I think when people think about King of Pops holistically, they kind of think about the brand um, as much or maybe more than the product. And the brand is all about happiness. It's about joy, like you said, and it's about sharing those experience and moments with uh, people that you love and care about. Well, I hope one day uh, when all this pandemic and the virus is over, we have a vaccine uh, that I get to come down there and meet you personally, Stephen. I look forward to meeting you and and seeing what's been done to the property that I used to ride horses on. So, yeah. and uh, and uh, Nick, I hope I don't know how often you're out in the Douglas County area, but uh, I'd love to meet you one on one at a later date because uh, you just I just like your attitude about your work you traded a law degree to make popsicles that's amazing <laughs> it's been, it's been an interesting life and interesting choices for sure but i really appreciate the the kind words and uh look forward to that as well um yeah it's i think it's interesting out there for everyone right now and you know we're not in a, in a different boat and so like stephen mentioned we he's down to one man show at the farm and i know that's been a bit difficult for him and We've been trying to figure out how to make it through this like, like everybody else without all of the events and concerts and festivals and, and things like that where we usually sell pop. So I have, I have confidence we'll make it, but, um, but it's, it's been a difficult time. Now, you're not looking for people uh, to, uh, to hire, are you, at this time? Not right now. Hopefully soon. Not hopefully. right now. Okay, hopefully <laughs> soon. Yeah, hopefully we get through this and on the other side we'll we'll certainly ramp back up okay well i thank each and every one i, I thank y'all for uh being here and uh, like i say i hate that we had to meet like this but i think it's going to turn out pretty good it will air uh during the rest of this month about twice a day i think but um it's been a pleasure to meet both of you and I, I, again, I, on behalf of Douglas County, I just, just want to say thank you for choosing Douglas County. <laughs> you know, the Fair Play area, uh, me being the commissioner down there, I, the residents down there want to keep it as green as possible. Yep. And they don't That's want a bunch of traffic and everything. And we just approved a, a, a preserve down there, which is a wellness preserve. But people won't live there. They will visit there to learn uh, about organic food and things like that. And there's also a sod farm on down the road from y'all too. So we're, we're trying to bring in industry down there that will not have a negative impact on that area. We want to keep it as uh, wide open as possible and as green and clean as we can keep it. <laughs> so green. anyway, well, thank you so much again. And um, I want to thank the audience for tuning in with us and uh, just um, enjoy your day. Have a popsicle. <laughs> Good day. Thank, thank you, Commissioner. You.